Send them back. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. Uh, hope everybody had a good uh, week last week. We had one week off. Um, uh, for those of you who are new, my name is Pete Irig. I'm a teaching pastor here at Island Community Church. This is our Wednesday night Island Connect series. Uh, we try to get together on Wednesdays and break bread together, some fellowship, and some studies. And the studies that we do on Wednesday nights are typically more background studies, not, um, you know, we have Sunday school on Sunday, we have sermons, uh, messages on Sunday, and of course we have Bible studies, and, and there's a whole lot of other things going on. But what we try to do on Wednesday night is give you some tools and background things <laughs> to help you be better in interpreting scripture and even witnessing to other people. So it's kind of more connecting the dots for you, some background tools. And what we've been doing for the last uh, four weeks is, uh, the name of the study is Christianity and Other Religions. <laughs> and um, you know, the whole goal here is, I'll get into in a minute, is really to try to give you a sense of the other religions as they compare to Christianity, knowing that Christianity is a true religion, however, um, most Christians don't know a whole lot about the other faiths. So when you start talking to people, or you hear stuff on the news, or you read stuff, you, you know, there's gaps in your understanding and knowledge, and it, it will help you, I think. Uh, it's, it's interesting, and it also helps you witness and, and understand world events a little better if you understand how other people are raised and, and how they think about Christianity or how Christianity is different. So let's start out with prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this time together. Uh, we, uh, we are so thankful that uh, you're, you, we are able to get together and get deeper in your word, deeper in our faith, share our, our knowledge and our faith with each other. Please, we pray that you illuminate our hearts and minds as we uh, together study this, and may we be uh, sharper and get deeper in the knowledge of your Son, and we can be able to share it with the world. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right. So this is our session four. Session one was just an overview. Uh, we're going to attempt through the early December to get through Islam, Judaism, and potentially Hinduism, or at least touch on the other ones. So the next time we get together, we're going to get one or two sessions in on Judaism. Um, and this will be the last night we've done. This will be our third night on Islam. So there's a lot here. And uh, so what we're going to do tonight as I said, the goal of these of these courses on Wednesday night is to get people better at interpreting scripture and, and kind of connect the dots, give you better background tools. No matter how how far and deep you are in your walk and in, in your study of scripture and, and, and our faith, uh, we can always get better, we can always get deeper, we can always learn from each other. And uh, the main thing I want you to get out of these sessions is to understand the basic differences between Christianity, what we claim our faith is and what we know our faith to be, and the other religions. And the main thing to me is you'll hear, as, as we've talked about in the other sessions, that many people will say, well, you know, all religions are the same, they all teach the same thing, you know, it's all basically the same thing, and it just, my head <laughs> explodes. <laughs> Uh, so, if nothing else, you should be able to have an intelligent one or two minute conversation of, no, they're not all the same thing. Matter of fact, they declare things that are completely opposite. So they all can't be true. It's a logical impossibility if you understand what those faiths are teaching. Okay. So, hopefully this will, you know, you'll find it interesting, you'll pick up some tools and maybe some, some knowledge that you know, you have to, if you want to, engage in better dialogues with people of other faiths, talk about Jesus Christ better. So, recap. 
I'll reiterate again, all religions do not teach the same thing. Yes, they all say, you know, you should take care of widows and feed orphans, but guess what? That's not the core message of the revealed truths of Islam and Christianity. Islam says that the angel Gabriel talked to Muhammad in a cave and revealed that there's one God and Muhammad's his last messenger. And by the way, Jesus Christ is a prophet, but not divine. He didn't die for anybody. He didn't forgive your sins. Christianity, of course, you know what that claim. They both can't be true. The core claims of Islam and Christianity, for example, are completely logically opposite. You can't, they cannot be true at the same time. And if you don't understand that, then you don't understand those faiths. So, and as we go through this, remember uh, we pointed out in scripture that you are under orders as a follower of Jesus Christ not to hate others, even if they hate you. It's written in there. Go look it up if you don't believe me, right? Uh, and when you share your faith, do it as Peter wrote with gentleness and respect. Now, especially tonight, I've, I've said this in the last couple of times, but I want you to remember this tonight. Whatever you hear from me tonight, if it doesn't sound right, then it isn't right, right? Where other religions deviate from Christianity, they're wrong, we're right. Everybody got that? So you're gonna hear a lot of off-kilter stuff tonight because we're gonna go over what Muslims believe and what they're taught based on their sacred writings, what they call their sacred writings, the Quran. And it's gonna sound like Alice in Wonderland to you if you're a Christian, you're like, what? But remember, 1.6 billion people on the planet have not read the Bible, they've read the Quran. So this is what they think they know about Christianity and Judaism, okay? So we talked about Muhammad. Uh, he was born, born in uh, Mecca. He started a new religion about around this one God of Abraham in a very polytheistic, you know, sixth century Arabia. Um, he uh, he started in Mecca. He got what he said in Revelation from the Archangel Gabriel in a cave. Started uh, sharing that message out. Eventually got run out of Mecca, went to another little town, and they renamed it Medina, created a community of, of what he would call Muslims, or ones who surrendered to the one God. And then eventually, after fighting a series of battles, a lot of struggles, uh, took over Mecca and, uh, and took over that Kaaba, the, that big black cube that was a polytheistic shrine, and he rededicated it to the one God and then died. Okay, after years after that. So he told everybody that the Archangel Gabriel uh, dictated this Quran, the sacred revelations, to him over a course of 23 years. So he'd go by himself to a cave or into a desolate, desolate place, and the Archangel Gabriel would tell him stuff. So the Quran, what Muslims believe, is that the Quran does not have anything in it from Muhammad. Muhammad was just a transmitter. This is what the Archangel Gabriel told me and somebody would listen, memorize it and eventually write it down. So the Quran doesn't contain quote unquote any human words. There is a perfect copy in Arabic up in heaven of the Quran. And when you use worship, it has to be in Arabic. And when you do corporate worship prayer, it has to be in Arabic because Arabic is the, is the language that God, what they feel God, through Gabriel, told Muhammad. Uh, we also said that there is, a, uh, you know, the Quran is, as I showed you last time, is, is maybe about a fifth of the, of the size of the entire Hebrew and, and New Testament, the Old Testament and New Testament. It's not real big. It's not in chronological order, so if you try to pick it up and read it from cover to cover, you're going to get pretty confused because it, it seems to jump all around. So it doesn't have necessarily what we're used to as Christians or even as Jews, an arc of a meta-narrative, right? You know, from Genesis all the way to Re Revelation. It is a collection of same of revelations that are not, they're basically in size order, not chronological. <coughs> And so there are, uh, after Muhammad 
died over the course of a couple centuries, uh, people recorded, oh, here's what Muhammad said, and here's what he liked to eat, and here's some of the things that he did, and, uh, and so all this collection of things around the life of Muhammad and what he said became this big collection of writings outside the Quran called the Hadith, and that's very important to them, just like you have collections of writings, the Talmud in Judaism, and you also have the Torah, those two things are, are not equivalent, but I mean, they had the same type of authority for Jews and for Islam. So you have extra canonical writings that I don't, other than maybe papal bulls for Catholics, there's no equivalent in Christianity. For as good as a, a Christian writer is, and you pick your favorite writer, you think you're the most holy person, Augustine, Luther, C.S. Lewis, Jaffa, whoever it is, nothing even comes close to inspired scripture. Okay, in Christianity. Last time we, we explored, um, all right, so if you're a Muslim, so what do you do? You know, what, how do you act out your faith? And there is something called the five pillars of Islam. These are five things, mandatory things that all Muslims must do. And so they must have that profession of faith. That's the thing that if you say it three times with the right witnesses, you're a Muslim. And uh, you have prayer, and there's uh, regimented prayer five times a day. You have to do prayer, and then there's there's a whole bunch of different types of liturgy and prayer. Almsgiving, the zakat, remember we talked about that? Uh, like in places like Saudi Arabia, it's mandatory. It's collected by the government. It's for the poor. Most other places in Muslim countries, it's voluntary, and there's depending on which sect of, of whether you're Shiite or Sunni, it has different percentages of your wealth that you have to give every year. Fasting, month of Ramadan, right? We talked about that, the ninth uh, month of the lunar calendar of Islam is the month of fasting for Ramadan. And then everybody's encouraged to do a pilgrimage to Mecca once in their life, emulating what a Muhammad did. And that's a very honorable thing. If you were able to go on a pilgrimage to Mecca, and you then become a Hajj, you, you, a Haji. You, you are someone who made the pilgrimage and you're esteemed in your community. Yeah. So that's the five pillars of Islam. We, we talked about all that stuff last week. So what are we gonna talk about this week? Well, I'm gonna wrap this up. And, and, and the reason I, I saved it to now because there's a lot here. I, I, didn't, want to, I didn't want to do it too lightly. I will again tell you, I am not an Islamic scholar. I am not a comparative religion scholar. I've studied about it, I've, I've read a lot about it. I know missionaries. I've never been a missionary to another country. Um, I, I, but, um, so if you scratch me too hard, I'm just gonna say, I don't know, I'll get back to you. Uh, but this is really important to me, and this was probably one of the biggest eye-openers as I started studying this a couple years ago, and then this year in preparation for this, is, um, who here, uh, for example, who here has ever read the Quran, any part of the Quran? One person. Very little. Very little. Okay. If, if we were in, say, Indonesia or Saudi Arabia, and I had a kind of a, a Friday night class, you know, after mosque, uh, after our service or something, and we were studying comparative religion, and I was trying to teach you what Christ Christians believe, if I ask the same question to Muslims, guess what? They Nobody would probably have read the Bible. Now, they think they know what's in the Bible because the Quran tells you about Jesus and about the Old Testament figures and so on and so forth. But they have not read the Bible, just like you have not read the Quran. So in some ways, when you're talking, you're talking past each other because you don't know what they were taught. And they think, and you think you know what they know. And then they think you know, you know Oh, I know what you believe. You, you get taught this, and that's heresy. And like, you don't get taught that. Where'd you get that? So, it's been a very. It's gonna. You're gonna hear some stuff that's gonna be head scratching to you. So, so set the stage. Islam believes the scripture. Remember, we said that Islam teaches that there are three revelations from the one God. All right. So there are three times where. The God of Abraham actually gave revelations in kind of written form to humankind. The first was Moses got the Torah. Okay? 
The second was Jesus got the gospel. And the third was Muhammad got the Quran. Now, they will teach and they believe, and the Quran says that the Jews and the Christians corrupted their revelations. So that the scriptures you have, you say, it's right here in the Bible, they'll say, that's corrupted. Okay? So, <clears throat> they believe that Muhammad got the final revelation and it's perfect, without error. Now, in the Quran, the Jews and the Christians are called people of the book. All right? Why? Because the people of the, of the holy writings, if you will. We might, in their minds, we screwed it up, but we're still people of that heritage of the revelation. So we're called people of the book. And so uh, I'll have a lot of quotes here from the Quran. Um, in here, there's a quote. You will find the people most hostile toward believers, that is Muslims, are the Jews and the polytheists. And you will find that the nearest ineffection toward believers, that is Muslims, are those who say we are Christians. That is because among them are priests and monks, and they are not arrogant. What does that mean? Well, again, I'm not an Islamist scholar. I'm sure there's, there's professors and, and theologians who really can unpack that. But from my understanding, from my reading about this, is that Muhammad knew, must have known some aesthetic monks, Christian monks, somewhere in his caravans. So he must have been impressed with, oh, here's some holy people. But remember, early on when he went to uh, Medina and they, and they had to take over Medina, he had battles with the Jewish tribes there that would not submit to, to Islam. So there was seen to be some historical built-in animosity there or uh, conflict, more conflict with the Jews than with the Christians at, during his lifetime, which we would say as Christians looking at this as not divine scripture, this is man-made, this is Muhammad, saying, oh yeah, I got this thing. That's what his mindset was. Do they, do they think we corrupted the scripture on purpose, or like you know, the clergy, our clergy did? Not that I know of. I, my sense of it is, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here. My sense of, of the research I've done is more of, you don't have the original scriptures of the New Testament. You don't really have the gospel. It's been corrupted so many times, whereas the Arabic and the Quran is perfect. So it's almost that argument that says you just don't have it and you're unwilling to uncorrupt it, which is even worse. If you know it's wrong, you should go to the Quran. And you won't, so therefore you're stubborn and you're blaspheming type of thing. It's kind of a circular argument. It's wrong. Well, it's not wrong. Yes, it's wrong. Why? Because my scripture says it's wrong. This says it's wrong. Apologetic note. And there's some passages in the Quran that out and out, you know, like they say here with the Jews, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're not good, that are, you know, beware of the people, the book, they've corrupted stuff, you know, don't, don't have anything to do with them, and so on and so forth. And then there's other passages that will say, oh, there are people in the book, treat them well, you know, have them pay the tax. So it's like, which, right? You know, so again, it's not chronological, it's not a, an arc of a story necessarily. So you'll have passages in there, to me, look pretty, you know, if you wanted to find uh, some kind of justification to hate Christians and Jews, it's in there. If you want some kind of justification to say, hey, you know, we ought to be moderate, it's in there. It's both. So, Quran and the Old Testament, the, the, the Hebrew Old Testament, the Torah. There are 24 Old Testament prophets named in the Quran. Okay? There are four Old Testament prophets that are named more than any of them and that are highly esteemed. And that they call Adam, Noah, Abraham, and Moses as the, the top four prophets of Islam, right, before Muhammad. Because again, it was the God of Abraham, so therefore, even though the Jews corrupted the Hebrew Bible, this is what the revelation from Gabriel told Muhammad. 
right? Now, sometimes when you look through the Quran, sometimes the stories about the Old Testament prophets track pretty well with the Hebrew Bible, and sometimes they're like, Phew. they have stuff in there that's not in the Hebrew Bible, or they some something you know. You know, Jeremiah does this, like, no, Jeremiah never did that. Where did you get that from? So you'll, you'll see things like, here's a quote, Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was a monotheist, a Muslim. Right? That's what they're, that's in their Quran. That's what they're taught. Out of all the Old Testament prophets, the one that has the most written about him is Moses. And so, um, and most of the commentators that I've, I've researched saying that there's a parallel that Muhammad somehow really kind of patterned himself after <clears throat> Moses. Why? Because Moses got a revelation from God and he was a warrior prophet, right? He, he freed the Jews from Egypt, he fought Pharaoh's army, planned the uh, conquest with God's help of Canaan, land of Canaan. Well, Here's Muhammad, I am a prophet, just like Moses, and I am leading my army. So there's a pattern there that, that I think that Muhammad and his followers saw a close pattern to Moses of the, of the Hebrew Bible. And even to the point where it says, and in one passage says, or do you want to question your messenger, i.e. Muhammad, as Moses was questioned before? So he's basically comparing himself on the same level as Moses. Remember, Muhammad is what's called, the Muslims call him the seal of the prophets. It's the last prophet. Again, Moses, great prophet. Jesus, another great prophet. And lastly, Muhammad, the last prophet. Of course, we don't believe that, but that's what they believe. Interesting question here. There's no... There, there is a summation of the Ten Commandments, kind of Ten Commandment teaching in the Quran. I've, I've seen a couple of those passages. But there's no real hardcore detail about what's in the Torah. If you look at the Torah, the first five books of, of the Hebrew Bible, there's a ton of detail in there. There's Leviticus, Deuteronomy, there's 630 commandments. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. None of that's in there. Why? Well... You know, Muslims say, well, the God, this is the revelation of God. A non-Muslim, like us, would say, hmm, do you think maybe Muhammad, since he was illiterate, didn't know what was in it? Only what he heard around campfires and caravans about the Hebrew Bible? Cherry yeah, cherry-picking, or didn't even understand, really, the detail that was in, in those books anyway. Just maybe didn't like it as much. Maybe didn't like it, I don't know, but... You know, I, the, the commentators that, I, that I've seen, you know, raise this as, a, as an apologetic point, saying, you know, there's a lot of detail missing there. <clears throat> All right, this is where this gets to the heart of it. So the Quran and Jesus. Now, in the Quran, in Arabic, <laughs> Jesus is called Isa. All right, that's the name Jesus. But more commonly is Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, son of Mary. Jesus in the Quran and in Islam is a very holy person. But, and was a great prophet, a great prophet, was given the gospel, direct revelation from God. However, he was not divine. He was not God. There's only one God. God doesn't have a son. God didn't have sex. What are you talking about? Because in Arabic, or at least in the Quran, there's no concept of what we would say sonship outside of biological. If you say son of, that means you had sex. And that's blasphemy. There's one God, just one. So, you know, they believe Jesus was not divine, was not the son of God, did not die on the cross, it's in the Quran, didn't die on the cross, and was not resurrected. Now, you got somebody saying, well, you know, all religions teach the same thing. I can stop right here, right? It doesn't make any logical sense. They have a, what they say is the divine revelation that is completely counter to what we know as divine revelation and truth. 
They both can't be true. We know it's true. So in this passage here in the Quran, it says, And we sent down Noah and Abraham and bestowed on their offspring prophethood and the book. Some were rightly guided, but many were corrupt. Then we sent our messengers to follow in their footsteps. And we made Jesus, son of Mary, to follow and gave him the gospel and placed compassion and mercy in the hearts of those who followed him. And there's a lot in there about. Matter of fact, the only woman named in the entire Quran is Mary. The only book in the Quran that is named after a woman is Mary, the, the, the mother of Jesus. So it's not like they deny, oh, Jesus didn't exist or he, he wasn't holy. They think he's holy. He's a great prophet. He's just not God. And that's blasphemy if you say he's God. Good question. You know, they say gospel. Well, and I would think, <clears throat> what I gather, the gospel is there's one God. It's the monotheistic, you know, same as what, what Muhammad is declaring. There's one God, no other God behind him. And then, you know, there's compassion and stuff. But I came to save the entire world. I came to die for all your sins and clean your sins and to resurrect three days later. And therefore, if you believe in me, you too will have eternal life. That's not the gospel. Well, we know that's the gospel. So if that's been the gospel, remember, Jesus died in about 33 AD. The last New Testament book was written in about, say, 90 AD. Muhammad lived you know, you know, a couple hundred years later. The gospel has been around. Maybe you don't understand. Muhammad himself did not understand what he was hearing around the campfire. So... The gospel, as what Muslims think we believe a gospel is, that we corrupted it, that we added all this other stuff, is wrong. Do you have a sense of what the reference to we is in this book? I, I, I would guess it's Gabriel and God and Gabriel and the angels, or I, I don't know. Maybe it's a royal we. I don't know Arabic. So, you know, like in Hebrew, sometimes when you see we, it's the majestic yeah. pronoun, you know. Um, Apologetic note, again, I'm not a missionary, but I've talked to people. Other than a relationship, like I want to sit, if you're, uh, if you're a missionary in a Muslim majority country, a Christian missionary, you're probably going to want to start with a relationship. You don't say, hey, everything you know is wrong. <laughs> it's usually not a good apologetic <laughs> thing anyway, right? You wouldn't do that down at Starbucks. You want to start a relationship. You want to show the love of Christ. You want, you want to uh, open that dialogue. The point of intersection where people have the best initial dialogues is Isa. Because if you say, hey, can I talk to you about Isa? Oh, Isa. Isa is great. Yeah, he's really holy. Yeah, we believe that too. Well, let me tell you what we believe about Isa. No, 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 no. That's not right. Well, have you ever read our scriptures? No, but I know what's in it. You know, you, you use that as a common point of departure. Because they all know who Isa is. Okay. Funny, they know by Isa, but they don't know what Isa claims. Right. So we're going to get into it. So the Quran affirms the virgin birth. There's a story about Mary, you know, having a virgin birth. But it has a whole bunch of stuff in there that is not in our New Testament. That is not part of Scripture. So. For example, when Mary, in the Quran, the passages where Mary gives birth under a palm tree, and you know the people from the town come and say, "You gave birth. You're not married. Are you, 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 you know, you've shamed us all, and you're trying to accuse her of adultery and stuff." She just points to the newborn in the cradle, and Jesus, as a newborn baby, talks to them. It says, "I am the servant of God. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet." That's what is in the Quran. Didn't happen, but that's what's in the Quran. There's a story in the Quran about Jesus making a clay bird come to life and fly away. Obviously not in the New Testament. Although, interestingly enough, that story is in one of the heretical early Christian documents, the Gospel of Thomas. 
which is a, a, a Gnostic, heretical, never ascribed to anything, but that story is in there. So where did Muhammad get it from? Probably some nutcase Christian walking around the wastes, right? So you're, you're, you're picking, picking things and you're not even understanding what's going on, right? And, be, and here's another. And because of their saying, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, God's messenger, they slew him not, nor crucified him, but it appeared to them as if they did. Indeed, those who differ about him are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumptions. Certainly, they did not kill him. So in the Quran, it says Jesus was not crucified. That's a lie. That's without a cross, there's no Christianity. Without an empty tomb, there's no Christianity. In their sacred writing, they deny that. And they're taught that that's, that's a falsehood. Jesus wasn't crucified. They say that, but he wasn't. All right. We uh, last time we talked something. Uh, there's an Arabic term called shirk, which is probably one of the worst blasphemies you can do in Islam. And shirk is equating the one God with anything else. You know, oh, God's in that tree, or I saw the face of God in the cloud. That's shirk. There is one God. He is transcendent, unique. There's no nothing like him. Nobody like him. Never had a son, never had a wife, just transcendent. So that sin of shirk is a pretty big sin in Islam. And so it taught the, the Quran talks about that. Surely Allah will not forgive those who assign partners to him. He forgives all but that to whom he pleases. Whoever ascribes partner to Allah, partners to Allah is guilty of monstrous sin. Partners i.e. the Trinity, that's shirk. There's not three gods, there's one God. I'm like, no, 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 we believe there's one God. No, 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 I know what you believe, it's in the Quran. So this next one, O oh, people of the book, meaning, you know, Jews and Christians, commit no excess in your religion, nor say anything but the truth about God. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of God and his word which he conveyed to Mary and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers and say, not three. Cease, it is better for you. God is only one God. Far is it removed from his transcendence that he should have a son. It is an explicit knock on the Trinity. So to, to Muhammad and to Muslims, the Trinity is blasphemy. We have corrupted the gospel and the knowledge of the one God. There cannot be a son of God. God doesn't have a son. God is above everything. Holy Spirit, there's no Holy Spirit in the Quran, so they don't even know that, right? So we'll get to that, what they think the Trinity is in a minute. But even the, the, the concept of the Trinity of, of God, you know, three in one, right? One substance, three per people. That to them is blasphemy. So this last quote here. <clears throat> that have, they have disbelieved who say God is the Messiah, the son of Mary. They have disbelieved who say God is the third of three. When there is no God save one God. If they cease not what they say, a painful torment will fall upon those, uh, upon those of them who disbelieve. So there are many passages in there where it really says there's no such thing as three in God. There's no son of God. Jesus was not the son of God. Remember, as far as I can, I can tell in the research, when you say son of, and especially in Arabic, it is biological. So you're almost like inferring that God had sex with somebody and he's got a son? That's blasphemy. That's true. That's So Muslims equate, when we say Jesus is the son of God, what they hear is Jesus is the biological, somehow the son of God, and that is blasphemous. 
I'm like, no, 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 no. People who you think he's actually God. You know he's actually God. And again, if you're talking to someone like that, you are if they've never read the Bible, they are going like this with you. Because their frame of reference, what they think that you believe, is not what you believe. But they've never read your scriptures. <clears throat> so the Quran and the Trinity. This is kind of a big passage, but I wanted to include because I thought it was very interesting. It says, fight those who do not believe in God, nor in the last day, the, the resurrection. Uh, the, 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 not the resurrection, well, the, the judgment day, if you will. Uh, nor forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden, nor abide by the religion of truth. From among those who receive the scripture until they pay the due tax, willingly or unwillingly. Right? So, if you've got Jews and Christians living amongst you believers, then make them pay the tax. Either force them or, you know, let, they can live amongst us, but they got to pay the tax. The Jews said, Ezra is the son of God. That's blasphemy. Ezra can't be the son of God. God doesn't have a son. And the Christians said, the Messiah is the son of God. That's blasphemy. God doesn't have a son. What are you talking about? These are statements out of their mouths. They emulate the statements of those who blasphemed before. May God assail them. How deceived they are. They have taken their rabbis and their priests as lords instead of God as well as the Messiah, son of Mary, although they were commanded to worship none but the one God. I find it interesting in this passage, they're slamming priests. In the other passage, it was almost like, well, they got priests and monks, so they're pretty, they're okay. I'm like, all right, which is it, right? Again, it's all over the place. But you can see, they equate when if, if Muhammad heard a Jew say, oh yeah, Ezra, he was, a, he was a son of God. He's like, no, that's blasphemy. God didn't have sex. He can't be a son. Jesus, the Messiah, is a son of God. The son, capital S. What, are you crazy? No. All right, so the, their, their frame of reference is just, it just blows their mind, right? Especially since their, their verses support that. This last one is very interesting. It says, and when Allah, and when I put this in here, most of these places I took out Allah, put in God, for them it's interchangeable. Allah is the Arabic name for, for what they, who they call God. And when Allah said, oh Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as deities beside Allah? He will say, exalted are you. It is not for me to say that to which I have no right. What this passage is, is saying is that the Muslims are taught through the Quran that the Trinity, as taught by Christians, is the Father, the Son, and Mary. So Muslims all around the world, unless they're very educated, they're going to say, oh, the Trinity, you worship God, but you also worship Jesus, Isa, as a son, and you worship Mary. That's the Trinity. That's blasphemy. And you're looking at him like, what? <laughs> you can see where they got that about Mary, but they got a lot of Right, so you imagine you're illiterate Muhammad, you're on a caravan to Syria, or on the edges of, of the Byzantine Empire, you go and you're going down the street and here's this big cathedral or you know, here's this big church, maybe you walk into it, you look and you see icons and you see people praying to Mary. Oh, well, obviously, you know, it's Jesus, the Father, and Mary. There's no conception of the Holy Spirit because he didn't understand it. Is there any reference of John the Baptist at all in that? I, yes, I believe so. Yeah. Not a lot, though. Um, so, I, if you, I know you, you had asked me pointedly, can't you use some verse to, to disprove it? And, well, again, I'm not an Islamic scholar, I'm not an interpretive scholar. However, let me point out something, right? There's no Orthodox Christianity from the beginning of Christianity who made the Trinity the Father, Son, and Mary. Didn't happen. No, and so some Muslims will say, well, you know, 
first couple hundred years of, of Christianity, there was a lot of debate on who Jesus was and who the Trinity was, because Trinity is not in your New Testament. So that was a made-up thing that you guys made up, and, and you couldn't agree amongst yourselves for a couple hundred years anyway. <clears throat> well, it is true that in the first couple hundred years of Christianity, the core theological tussles, if you will, was to really define the nature of the Trinity, but not who is in the Trinity. That was always settled. It was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's in, it's in Scripture, our Scripture. That was never under debate. Mary was never thought of as one of the Trinity, ever. I mean, there might have been some nutcase Christian heretic walking around the oasis or something saying that. I, I will say I am a junior early Christian scholar. That is my specialty. There's no, there's no, nothing there. Matter of fact, by 381 AD, the last council that, that uh, talked about this, they finalized the Nicene Creed on who the Trinity was a couple hundred years before the birth of Muhammad. So even, uh, you know, 150 years before Muhammad was even born, it was settled orthodoxy. It was the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. Three people, three persons, one substance. Jesus, two natures, one person. It was settled 150 years before Muhammad was born. He didn't know that? Or the, the archangel Gabriel didn't know that? That is clearly wrong. <laughs> historically wrong, not just theologically, historically. And you're saying this is a perfect thing? So if you're looking for one thing to hang your hat on, if you want to start an argument, this is the one oh, I would gosh. Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> You've been waiting for this one. Weeks. So that's probably one of the biggest ahas that, you know, when you start really looking at this. It's like they're being taught by infallible scripture stuff that is not right. We don't believe that. We never have. And believe me, I'm just scratching the surface. Um, there's a lot there. But I wanted to give you a sense of what their writings say about what's core to our faith. You know, the, the, our scriptures, the, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, who Jesus is. They have no conception through their holy writing. And if, if they have never been to a Western university, they've never taken courses about Christianity or Judaism, if they're just a normal person who will only get everything they get from a mom that never cracked open a, a, a Christian or a Jewish Bible, this is what they think that we believe. Or th this is what they think is true, and this is why they think that we've corrupted it, because their holy writings say so. So I'm going to switch gears here just a little bit. <clears throat> I want to tell you the rest of the story, kind of historically leading up to today. There's a thing called the Golden Age of Islam. Remember, when Muhammad died two years after taking over Mecca, I mean, they basically controlled an area around Medina and Mecca and some oasises in Arabia in the 6th century. Well, it spread like wildfire, mainly through conquest. So from the 8th to the 14th centuries, it's called the Age of the Caliph. The Caliph, you ever hear the word caliphate, the caliph? That's the kind of Islamic leader, right? And so it spread all the way, you know, it started in Arabia. It spread that way all the way to northern India, and this way all the way to Spain, all of North Africa. So all of that was under a caliph, and it was all Islamic. So that's known, you know, for a couple hundred years, so from the 8th to the 14th century, was known as the Golden Age of Islam. Why? Because at this point, say like in the 9th century, in Western Europe, there was all these little feudal kingdoms, and they were eating mud pies as serfs. I mean, and nobody knew how to read or write other than monks in the monastery. It was the you know, end of the Dark Ages. At that same time, I mean, they, they were building gardens and fountains, and they had scholars that uh, knew ancient Greek, and they 
medicine and arithmetic, you know, it was the flowering of their civilization. The Roman Empire had fallen. Oh yeah, the Roman Empire and the West, West. fell forward 76. The Byzantine Empire was still there, but by the 14th century, the Byzantine Empire collapsed and was taken over by Islam. So you had this, you know, if you looked at it from a, from a Western European standpoint, you're getting surrounded by these Islamic armies, this empire. And so what Muslims will look back at is like, this was our heyday. This was the golden age. We had it going. And then it kind of fell apart. Um, it gradually, you know, we had the Renaissance uh, in the West in the 1400s, uh, the flowering of European civilization, the strengthening of these kings, the uh, popes, you had Reformation, you had this, the Enlightenment, you had industrialization, the nation states rising in Western Europe, and the Islamic. By this time, the Islamic Empire was, was so old, they were kind of losing their bubble. And when they came up against the Western Europeans at that point, there was no choice. And really what happened, uh, it, it shrunk down to basically the Ottoman Empire. But uh, the Ottoman Empire was known as the sick man of Europe. It was just, you know, barely hanging on by a thread, all these, you know, all these in Arabia and, and Egypt and stuff. Well, World War I knocked them out of the box. Permanently. They sided with Germany, they lost, and so all of those, all of those uh, territories became, guess what, colonies of Western European nations, England, France, Germany, you know, not Germany, but England and France primarily. So all of a sudden you go from this age of uh, Islam is flowering, you know, we're conquering the world, to now we're living under Christian, Christian nations. What happened? Not, not a pleasant time when they look, when a, a Muslim scholar would look back at that, at that time. Okay. All right, so fast forward a little bit. I alluded to this way up front when we started to talk about Islam first, but I want to go a little deeper. Uh, I showed you some pie graphs about the distribution of how many Muslims there are in the world versus Christians, and I, I did mention. Sunni versus Shiite, right? So when you talk about Muslim, all right, I'm a Muslim, there are divisions within Islam, just like there are divisions in Christianity or even Judaism. You know, there's uh, ultra-Orthodox Judaism, there's Reform, there's Conservative. Uh, in in uh, you know, Christianity, there's Eastern Orthodox, there's Roman Catholic, there's Protestant, there's you know, a whole bunch of divisions. There are divisions in Islam as well. There's a number of them, but the two major ones, and the only ones I'm going to talk about, and which covers practically almost all of them, are Sunni and Shiite. So Islam started to divide almost immediately after the death of Muhammad. Why? Because Muhammad died and didn't leave a successor. So remember, this isn't just, this isn't, this is also. It's a community, it's a military machine, it's a, it's a faith. And so without a leader, then who's going to lead the armies and who's going to conquer all these territories? So it immediately started to divide over who was going to be the caliph. Now that Muhammad's dead, who's going to lead us? Who did Muhammad want to lead us? He didn't say, as far as we know. So one division is called the Sunni. And they claim that this guy, uh, Abu Bakr, uh, who's the father-in-law of Muhammad, was proclaimed the caliph, all right? So all the caliphs from that guy forward basically conquered that whole southern world, all right? So they, that was a Sunni empire. Um, the caliphate eventually stretched, as I showed you, from Spain all the way to northern India. Um, over the course of those centuries, the center of Islam changed depending on where the caliph was from and, and you know, this guy passed on to this guy. And so it, it, it moved from where Muhammad started in Arabia, then it moved to Iraq, 
and then moved to Damascus in Syria, then moved to Baghdad, to Cairo, and then finally, toward the end of, of all that stuff, to Istanbul. Right, so that's where the caliph was, or the sultan, if you will. But as I said, by World War One, you know, end of World War One, that whole thing fell apart, and whatever was left. And Ataturk, who's known as the modern father of Turkey, abolished formally the caliphate in 1924. No more caliphate, no more worldwide caliphate. There's Turkey and there's nation states and you know whatever. Now, there is another sect that started at about the same time called the Shiites. They believe that Muhammad appointed this person, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was the cousin and son-in-law of Muhammad as the successor in his lifetime. Now, the Sunnis don't believe that. The Sunnis believe this other guy. But the Shiites believe that. Matter of fact, Shiite means party of Ali. So they look to this guy, Ali, as the rightful successor for Muhammad. Ali was murdered by Sunnis in 661, so there's this martyrdom of Ali. So that is an, the other big part of uh, the two parts of Islam. So if you look at it today, 80% of all Muslims in the world are Sunni. Okay? Iran is Shiite. Iran's a theocracy, meaning the head, the formal head of their state is the Ayatollah, who's a Shiite. Okay. Uh, I read a poll, a few uh, research conducted a couple years ago. Forty percent of Sunnis polled think that Shiites are heretics. So it's not just oh, you know, you're Protestant, or you're, you know, you're Episcopalian, you're Lutheran. It's like you're a heretic. Okay. A lot of bad blood there. So you see this reflected in things today like rivalries between certain nations. Right? So you see like a rivalry between Iran, which is Shiite, and all the Sunni countries, right? Because they're, you know, they're like this. Especially between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is Sunni. What do they got going for them? They got Mecca and Medina. They view themselves as the center of Islam, right? You, know, you should come to the pilgrimage here. And they view Shiites as, well, you're, you're, you're not really Muslim, are you? And so that has become also a political military rivalry. There's, there's, there's no love lost between those, those leaderships of those countries and even the faiths of those countries. Um, there's even a rivalry within Sunni, the Sunni world. Why? Because you had, if you've been reading the newspaper just the last couple of months, you know how that uh, Saudi uh, journalist got killed in Turkey. You know, some of the um, analysts will say, well, this is just kind of an outgrowth of the rivalry between Turkey and Saudi Arabia over the who's going to be the leader of the Sunni world. You know, Turkey desperately wants that. And so if they can use this as a wedge to kind of knock down Saudi Arabia, so there are these overtones that bleed into political um, and certain